point number one, point number one and two, it says here, the mitzvah of building a mikvah takes precedence over building a synagogue. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, the most important thing is a mikvah. A synagogue or Torah stroll can be sold to raise funds for the building of a mikvah because mikvah is so central to Jewish life. The truth is a synagogue you can meet, a group of Jews can meet in any place. It doesn't have to be a synagogue, but you have to have, every Jewish community has to have a mikvah. So it takes presence over a synagogue. Okay, point number three. There are two types of mikvah. The first one, as we talked about it a little bit last week when we came to talking about tefillat kalim, the immersion of utensils. The first one is what we call a kalim mikvah, which literally means a utensil mikvah. Kalim means utensils, mikvah is mikvah. The second one, the second type, the main type of mikvah is a mikvah for people. Okay, we're going to see both of those this evening. We're going to start with the kalim mikvah, which is out here. And then we'll go back into the building and we're going to see the mikvah for people. <laughs> okay, so what does mikvah mean? Look at number four. Mikvah literally means a gathering. A gathering together. Here in this, in this context, it means the gathering together of water. An interesting side point, the word mikvah is also related to the Hebrew word tikvah. As in hatikvah, which means... The yeah, the hope. So the word mikvah, or something gathering, also means hope. Perhaps we'll explore that idea a, bit, a little bit later. The word mikvah is in the source number, in point number five. The word mikvah appears three times in the Torah. The first one in Bereshis chapter 1, verse 10, which is in the creation story, where the Torah tells us about God gathering the waters together to form the seas and dry land. The word mikvah is used there. And there's two other references in Shemot and in Vayikra. Source number, uh, point number six is that Hashem, God himself, is referred to as a mikvah. God is called mikvah, mikvah Yisrael, the mikvah of the Jewish people. How we understand that, we'll, we'll have to talk about another time perhaps. But you will see three references to that in the prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah. And you'll see the references there. Now, where do we know, as we've looked at all other things during this course, where do we know what is the source for the requirement to have a mikvah both for our kalim and for human beings? It's based, as number seven says, all the halakhic requirements, all of the details, and there are a number and number of details with regard to the construction and the, and the uh, requirements of a mikvah. They're all based on one verse in the Torah. In Vayikra chapter 11, verse 36, says the verse in source number eight, Achmayan ubo mikveh, you see I put it in bold, mikveh mayim yiyetahor. Only a spring or a cistern or a reservoir, a gathering of water remains pure. And from that the rabbis derive all <coughs> of the detailed requirements of halakhic uh, parameters that govern a mikveh. First thing we need to know about a mikveh, number nine, is that a mikveh essentially must be made of, must contain what we call mayim chayim, literally live or living water. So that means a mikveh can come from a natural spring or a well of naturally occurring water, thus can be supplied by rivers and lakes which have natural springs as their source. We also said last time that the sea as a gathering of water is also a valid mikveh. And now a system, a system filled with rain is also permitted. And the first thing I'll draw your attention to then is that we can gather rainwater to create a mikvah. So if you look at this brick-built structure behind Jason and Scott, okay. from the ground upwards, that contains pure rainwater. And you can see it's connected by a pipe that leads up. Can you see that? All the way up. And that, that, that drain pipe leads to an opening on a flat roof. So whenever it rains, the water runs off that flat roof, down the pipe and into this reservoir. Now that isn't the mikvah. Although, if you really wanted to, you could use that as a mikvah. Because it is a kosher, valid mikvah. It has the required quantity of water within it. But some people who are more delicate would not necessarily want to dip into pure rainwater. Okay, so we use that as a reservoir of the required quantity. And from that, as I'll show you, that will be connected 
to fresh water, tap water, to create a nice clean and reusable hygienic mikveh um, uh, uh, internally rather than externally. Okay, so uh, number 10, a mikveh cannot be made of mayim shuvim, which is the opposite of mayim chayim. Mayim shuvim literally means drawn water. So if you were to collect water or, for example, tap water, which has been collected um, by human means, that in, is not valid as a mikveh. It can be used to add to your reservoir, but it can't be, you can't, for example, um, you can't take a bath and that, consider that to be a mikveh because that is where the water has been gathered together by human means. Number 11, similarly, water cannot be channeled through anything that could become tame. Remember, we're using these terms tame to mean not unclean, but to mean impure, something which is susceptible to spiritual impurity as opposed to spiritual purity. And therefore, water cannot through, th flow through pipes over metal clay or wood to be gathered. They have to gather naturally. So what are these pipes? Uh, those are, those are um, they're probably made of um, ceramic, ceramic pipes. I know that you can't see, I, I just checked earlier, I gave them a knock. Uh, they're, they're ceramic pipes, although they're, they're, they're black, black. Okay, number, number 12. A mikvah must contain enough water, this is rainwater now, freshly occurring water, to cover the entire body of an average sized person. But we never, we, leave, we never leave that to an arbitrary figure. And you see in number 13, the minimum volume of water required for a kosher mikvah is 40 se'a, which is a biblical measurement, equivalent to approximately 200 gallons of water. And so the bore, which is the Hebrew word for a reservoir or a pit, very much like the one we've got here, is approximately 25, uh, its minimum has to be 25 cubic feet in order to contain that amount of water. If you want to convert it into litres, feel free to do so at your own um, leisure. Point 14 is a very important point. This is, again, this is where we're going to break down the myth and mystery and misunderstanding. Fresh tap water is heated in a connecting pool, connected pool for immersion purposes joined by a hole which has to be a minimum of two inches in diameter through a method called hashaka, literally mingling. In fact, we're going to, I'm going to show you that the, the mikvah inside is actually created. There are two <coughs> methods of creating a mikvah, either by this method of hashaka, where literally you've got a one pool of rainwater that is connected by a small opening to another pool of clean tap water, heated tap water, by a little opening. And the water's literally, hashaka literally means kissing. The waters are touching, they're kissing each other. And by the fact that they're touching, it's as if they are one and the same entity. And therefore, although you're actually physically in <coughs> fresh tap water, clean heated tap water, since it's connected by, by this opening to the collection of rainwater, they're considered one and the same thing. That's the first method of creating a, a mikvah. The second way of creating a mikvah is that you take a, 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 a again, your pit, your, your reservoir of 40 seya of rainwater, and into it, you, you allow as much tap water as you like to go into it. You push it in, you drop it in, and as it's dropping in, the water level will rise up, it will flow over and into your clean pool. So it'll be clean and fresh water mixed with rainwater, and that will create, that's called zria seeding. It runs across through a little envelope I'll show you inside uh, opening, and that was another way of creating a mikvah. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Okay, so number point 15. What is a mikvah used for? So we've got two types of mikvah. The Kaleen mikvah, as we mentioned previously, is used for, number one, any utensils that come into contact with food that have been purchased from a non-Jew or have been manufactured by a non-Jew, even if they've been purchased by a Jew. This is not about koshering. Remember, we said there's a difference. This is not about making them kosher, that there's something non-kosher coming into contact with them. This is even before first use, or if you've never done it before, you can still do it even after you've used them um, in order to, to uh, make them fit for use. Point two, as we said, that strictly speaking, metal and glass, including Pyrex, require tefillah immersion with a bracha. 
Whereas glazed earthenware, china, porcelain still need Sevilla immersion, but they don't require a bracha because it's not of the same level of requirement as that of glass and metal. <coughs> Plastic in wood do not require tevila at all. The bracha for when you just before you're about to perform the mitzvah of tevila is Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedishanu. The mitzvahs are verse Yivanu that God has commanded us and sanctified us with His commandments and commanded us Al Tefillat Keli on the immersion of. A vessel, or if you're doing more than one, al tefillat kalim, the motion of vessels in the plural. We're going to do some in a minute, so it's your practical class. Okay, that's what a kalim mikvah is used for. Um, now point 16, what is the <laughs> other mikvah used for? Well, a number of uses. Firstly, for a bride before her wedding day, or on her wedding day. Point two, for a woman after nidah, her period of separation, what we call tarat hamishpacha, the upkeep of family purity. Number three, a woman after having given birth. And uh, important to note, since the, the, the Torah mitzvah of, uh, of tvila of immersion in the mikvah, is, is particular to women, only women are required to say a bracha on their immersion. And the, immer- and the bracha is the same beginning as the previous bracha. Here it ends, al hatfila, al hatfila, on the immersion. As, a, as a po- not only are women required to use the mikvah, but men also <coughs> are, have, are customary to use the mikvah. Again, some people may not know that, didn't know that. But men also can use the mikvah. Uh, men and women use the mikvah for conversion. The final stage of conversion is immersion in the mikvah. Uh, men have a custom before Yom Tov, particularly before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but some do it before all Yom Tovim uh, and before their wedding, on the, before their wedding day or on their wedding day to go to the mikveh. A sofa, a trained scribe who's about to write a Sefer Torah, he has to write it in a state of spiritual purity. And one of the ways to prepare himself is to immerse in a mikveh. And in temple times, when the Kohanim used to serve in the temple, Prior to their service in the temple, they would immerse in the temple. In fact, the, we, on Yom Kippur, we read about the high priest's service in the temple. And on Yom Kippur, the high priest would, would, would immerse seven times in the mikvah during the day of Yom Kippur. Okay, point 17. Tevila requires to- total immersion. You have to go completely into the water. Whether we're talking here, we're talking here both about utensils and about people. You have to be totally immersed in the mikveh, in the water, for the water to touch, touch every part of the utensil and the body. And for this reason, all clothing, jewellery, and even bandages, anything that is a barrier between the skin and the water has to be removed. Also important to know, going in the mikveh is nothing at all to do with cleanliness. Okay? People, you often hear it banded around, yeah, the mikvah, people used to go to the mikvah because Jews lived in hot countries and like today they got very schwitzy and the best way to get clean was to go in the mikvah. No, that's an absolute fallacy. Before you go in the mikvah, you have to be 100% clean. You have to have washed first and what I said, to, uh, uh, make sure there's no dirt on you whatsoever and be completely clean before tevila. So um, going to mikvah is nothing at all about physical cleanliness. You have to be prepared, you have to be physically clean first before you go into the mikvah because the mikvah is all about spiritual purity, nothing to, at all about cleanliness or, or hygiene. Also important to know, point 19 again, these rumors go round, you will not ever find a situation where a group of long bearded Vishtinkana rabbis will stand by and watch as a woman goes in the mikvah. It never, ever has ever happened. Okay? Do not quote me on that one. Women's, women's tevila is done in private. It's an app, completely private thing. <clears throat> Nobody else should know about it. You shouldn't discuss it with anybody else. You shouldn't dis- talk about it with anybody. You shouldn't tell anybody that you're going to make, you've been to Vic, you've never been to make, whatever it is, you should never tell anybody. It's pr- totally private. The only person who's present at the time of a woman's villa is what we, what we, uh, what we uh, generally refer to as a mikvah lady, a mikvah attendant, who is there 
not to spy on you, not to report back to the rabbi, not to take pictures, chas v'shalom. She's there purely and simply to confirm that the tevila you've done was correct. You were, because it's hard to know, always know whether you've gone completely under the water, and if you haven't, it's an invalid uh, uh, immersion. She's purely there to, to confirm for you that your tevila was a kosher tevila, was a proper tevila, a proper immersion. If they wanted to, yes, but not gen- never really done. And finally, um, important to know that women's tevila is generally done after dark because the Jewish day starts at night and the first opportunity, a woman should always go on her first opportunity to go to mikvah, and therefore the first opportunity is as soon as it gets dark, that start of the new day, and that's why women will generally go at night to the mikvah. Okay, any questions so far? Ah, oh, excellent, excellent point. Okay, to their credit, to their credit, this mikvah is owned and maintained by the Federation. Oh. It's the only mikvah in Essex. Yes, the only mikvah in Essex. And we're very lucky to have our very own Ruti, who is one of those uh, mikvah ladies that I refer to, does a tremendous, tremendous work. <laughs> one of three. One of, one of three. Um, who does tremendous work um, uh, maintaining the mikvah and 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 suiting to its all day-to-day uh, uh, needs? Um, but yes, the federation funds this, and in fact, um, the federation um, what, what about four or five years ago uh, um, invested a large sum of money, having the mikvah totally refurbished. So again, rumours. Uh, myths that go around that it's dirty, dingy and grotty are absolutely not true. The mikvah is kept absolutely spotlessly clean. It's clean, what, once, twice a week. The water is changed on a regular basis um, and it's kept absolutely spotlessly clean and it's really uh, um, the, the closest we're going to get to a spiritual spa in this area. So, any other questions? So yes, it's owned by the Federation. Hey, Rose. There, in this mikvah there isn't one, no. No, but there are mikvahs that do have hoists for, for those who, who, are, who, are, who have disabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a mikvah man for the males to make sure that their mikvah is No, no. Because, because the, me, uh, um, the men's uh, tevila is not at the same <laughs> level, at the same uh, halakhic requirement as the women's, they don't have to be checked as, as much. And that's why I said men can also, they, they, sometimes you go to mikvahs, very large mikvahs, where there be lots of people going in and out of the mikvah. But women's okay. one is private, it's individual, it's personal to her. Yeah. Do you make an appointment to come here or do you just knock on the door and come in? Um, women normally generally make an appointment to make sure yeah. that there's a, there's a mikvah attendant here and that, that everything is, is ready for them when they get here. Oh, so right. they make an appointment. Men do the same? Men don't need to make an appointment, no. The mikvah is open at certain times, uh-huh. uh, uh, published times for men to come. Okay. Yeah. The Kelly mikvah. Mm. So if, if say somebody was using some utensils at home, and, and everything that they used was strictly kosher. Mm. And then they decided, oh, I've learned about it and I want to take yeah. my box. Yeah. And can you do it even though they've excellent been questions. used? Excellent question, yes. Kosher yes. Food, All, yeah, kosher. excellement question, Pam. Yeah. Um, although, ideally, the first time you purchase a new utensil that's been manufactured or bought from a non-Jew, you should, before using it, you should immerse it in the mikvah, even if you haven't yet done that. So you used it. And it's kosher, but you've used it, but you haven't put it in the mikvah. But any, whenever, whenever you want to, you can always come and bring it to the Kaili mikvah. Now, I should make an important point. The Kaili mikvah is open 24 hours a day. Uh, I suggest you only really come during the day because it's light. Obviously, you have to come out here. Um, but if you wanted to come, you don't need to make an appointment to come to, 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 come to the Kaili mikvah. We have a, a code lock on the front door. Just to, if you want to know, ask one of the attendants or, or myself for the code and you can come whenever you want and, and use the facilities. You don't need anyone else here. Still. Okay. Okay. I'm not, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of, of what needs and what doesn't tonight. I want to talk about the mechanics of mikvah, okay? But I'll, I'll come back to that if we have time. Used by just one person each time? One person at a time? The indoor mikvah? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's only ever used by one person at one time. Male yes. or male officer? Yeah. No, the, yeah. the, the men would only come before yon, so if, yes. and the water is changed after the men have to Yeah, one second. So, so <laughs> the important difference is, as I said, yeah. women will come, generally will come after dark. Men actually only ever come during the day. There will, never, there will never be a time, again, that's a very important point to make. There will never be a time where men and women are using the mikvah at the same time. 
on the same on the same yeah. day at the same time during the day. There will never be any crossover between the two. Men only use it during the day. Women only use it at night. And after, if the mikvah has been opened and used by men, the water will be changed. It will be thoroughly cleaned, and fresh water will be put in. But if you're a bride, you come during the day, don't you? Yes, but again, the, 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 the appointment is already made, and and they'll, they'll make sure there are, no, there are no men there, okay. any men there at all. Okay. Have I yes. Also, that if there's more than one person, the the other people don't know that somebody else no, is there. No, it's technically either. completely private. Yeah, there may be more people, one or two more people in here. Just get one completely private. Yeah. No, 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 I thought you were no, about to ask a question. I'm listening. I'm okay, <laughs> let's, um, let's have a look then what we're talking about. So, let's start with the Kaling. Uh, let's start with the Kaling Mikvah. Okay, you have to come a bit nearer now. Okay, don't worry, no one's going to get wet tonight. Okay, unless you really want to. So, okay, so remember we talked about the two, the two ways of making a Mikvah. We said the first requirement is you have to gather. 40 say uh, what did we say what was the what was the equivalent about 200 gallons of of rainwater once you've got that you have a valley mikvah and then you can mingle that with fresh tap water so you'll see here you can see here can everybody see we're looking at this structure here yeah this brick built reservoir if i lift up the flat lid some of you may be able to be able to see inside. Come on the step if you can't see. Yeah. Well, because it's outdoors, don't worry. Okay, there's a massive gathering of rainwater here. Okay, that is a kosher mikvah. Now, if you want to, you can, you can come over, as you come past, you can fire past and have a look. You'll notice that some, some people have thought they're being clever and using this to dip their utensils in. If you look right down the bottom, you'll see there's an old rusting frying pan that somebody obviously dipped in, whoops, let go of it, and it's gone forever. Okay, that's why we don't generally use this one, because if you drop something in it, you're not going to get it back. So, for your convenience, for your convenience, we have an internal mikvah. Now you have to sort of, one at a time, have a look, let other people who haven't seen come have a look. Okay, I'll tell you what, you go in and I'll talk as you go in. Okay, have a quick look. Go in, have a look. You'll see there is a tiled, it looks like a sink, a tiled sink. Look to your left underneath the water line. Don't come out to the, to the left underneath the water line. You'll see there's a little opening. Yeah. That opening leads through to this, to this reservoir. So the water in this reservoir is connected to the fresh tap water in that sink, making that a kosher kaolin mikvah. So you can put your utensils in the clean Kaolin mikvah. And it's only very shallow, so your danger of dropping something is about the depth of your, uh, length of your arms. So you'll be able to pick it up. This rainwater? Yeah. Anyone know what this is made of? Is it a covering? Oh, yeah, it is. Is that red covering? Yeah. yeah, no, it's... It's very a red fancy. Mm, she wants to come into money somewhere. Or she's planning, planning to do something very sinister with me. <laughs> okay, so it looks like plastic. If it was plastic, we wouldn't have to toyable it. It's not, it's actually, it's actually metal. You are. Um, so we will, it is, it is something that requires, before we use it, tefillah with a bracha. So, you can do the tefillah, I'll say the bracha. Okay? <laughs> We've got a few things, so we'll do, we'll do a couple more things to go. Yeah, we'll do it all the same time, so we say the double bracha. Okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna do two things. So we're gonna say the plural bracha. She's really got something into me tonight. I mean, notice you'll see this little fish hat. This is the newest design for hats for Yontuf. Everybody will be wearing them this year. Now you've got, I'll give you a heads up on that one. Okay, now what we're gonna do is, for practical purposes, rather than drop the knives into the sink and lose them, I'll put them in there and we're gonna, Marion's gonna do it. But what you do, you go in. Okay. Before you do, do them, we'll say the, I'll say the bracha. Before I put it in. Before you put it in, then we'll put it in. True. You'll see that the bracha has been very handily, it's been printed on there, so I, so I can remember it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu B'Mitzvah Vertsi Vanu Al Tefilas Kalim. Amen. In and out. Yeah, make sure it's completely covered with water. Don't be afraid of it. If they yeah. do drop, you can fish them out. No, they're both completely covered. Okay. Lovely. Normally we wouldn't talk as we're doing it, but any any <laughs> <laughs> convers 
<laughs> well, I invalidated it. <laughs> any any conversation connected to the Tavila is permitted. Only any extraneous talking about the weather or anything like that is is not permitted. Okay, all well, that done. Yeah. Excellent. Good. We'll leave it there. We'll come back to it. Here's one I prepared earlier. I don't mind. You say it the person who's doing it should say. We literally be the person who's doing it should say it. Yeah. But I can sit on her behalf as well. We're doing it together. Can you drink meat and milk together? Yes. Yes, because it's all cold. Yeah, there's no, there's long, they have to be perfectly clean, no residue or anything on it, so it can be done together. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you see, we've done practically, we've dipped it in the mikvah. That was fresh water. You can see the taps, how the taps are going to refill that as we like. They're connected to the, the pit of rainwater. Okay, let's go inside. Okay, so you've prepared yourself, ready to go in the mikvah. You'll see, you can go down the stairs into the mikvah, into the deepest part, in order that. We don't have to duck down a little bit in order to be completely covered in the water. What you should notice is, firstly, from the heat in here, you'll know that this water is heated water. So it's not going to be freezing cold in the winter. It's going to be nice, uh, um, um, pleasant temperature. The room is also, well, the water's heated as well. The water's heated, so we have a nice ambient temperature in the room. You go down, this water in here is tap water. Fresh, clean, tap water. Okay? You see it's kept spotlessly clean. It's pumped out. There is a pump at the bottom of on the floor of the mikvah connected to a pump that sucks out all the water in order to be clean, uh, emptied fully, completely cleaned and dry, ready to be refilled. Now, I mentioned when we looked outside that there are two methods of creating a valid mikvah. One is hashaka, the kissing and mingling of the water. I showed you the outside reservoir that contain the valid rainwater that is connected inside here through a hole. So if you look just on the, you see the mikvah is rimmed by a dark blue line of tiles. Can you see there's a hole in the tiles on this wall here? Yeah. No, I see that's your... yes. Please, I'm sorry. Thank you. Can you see? There's a hole there, and again you'll be able to see if you look, there's a movement in the water. That's the opposite, that's through there, through that hole is that pit I showed you outside. So the waters are mingling, they're kissing each other, creating a valid mikvah. So although you're going in fresh heated tap water, it is touching and mingling, so halakhically this is considered to be a valid mikvah. Okay, that's the first method of creating a mikvah. The second method, we use two methods to create a mikvah, just for safety's sake. You'll see this little letter box here. Yeah, untiled, you'll see it's cement. This pipe that runs along here to a big stopcock there. When we want to refill the mikvah, so let's say the mikvah is empty of water, we want to refill it. What they do is they turn on this stopcock, which is a mains tap. Okay? The whole of Gantz Hill goes dry, <laughs> and all the water runs along this pipe outside into the second. If you know, you notice there were two whole manhole covers. The second one is an identical pit to the one, the first one I showed you. This also would also contain 40 seah, the required 200 gallons of water. This water is running, going to run through, down onto it, and by the forces of gravity push, well, forces of physics push. Once it reaches the level, it pushes the water back up again, and it will overflow through there. And it will overflow and overflow and overflow until this is filled. And then they turn that tap off. When is, it, when is that clear? Shall I explain that again? When is it heated? Hmm? When is it heated? The, there, are, there are radiators inside. There's a radiator there, there's a radiator there. Okay, so it's, into, it's cold water coming through, yeah. heated inside the mikvah. Okay, so let's just explain again. We've got an empty mikvah. We want to refill it with nice, clean water. So we turn on the tap. The, run, the water runs down this pipe, out externally into the pit of rainwater, fills it up, fills it up, fills it up, till it overflows to that height, all the way through this letter box, running across and down into the mikvah until it's filled up the whole mikvah. Once the mikvah is filled above this level, so it's also kissing, shaka is mingling, we turn off the tap and we have a valid, clean mikvah ready to go. Uh, understanding on the whole concept of mikvah, the idea that water is is something which is particularly within Judaism something which is very much wrapped up with our, our, our idea of spirituality. I want you to remember when we talked about things like 
um, Negelwasser in the mornings. Yes, washing their hands in the mornings. We said that had nothing to do with cleanliness. That was all about spiritual purity. That we've come into, we come close to a death experience, having been asleep. When we come back to life, we are washing off any remnants of that. I want you also to remember what we do when we, before we eat, we do Natila Sudaim. Again, we wash our hands using water. Not that our hands should be clean, because they have to be clean before that, but to spiritually prepare ourselves, to elevate ourselves to a level of tahara, of sanctity, of purity, ready to eat, to be, to be elevated human beings. Um, I want to also remind you, unfortunately a lot of us uh, have, have experience when we go to the grounds, Yes, having come back from the grounds, you know, the, atten- the, the superintendent always makes that strange announcement. Please make use of the, of the sinks either side of the doors before you go back into the hall. Again, because we've been on, in, on the grounds of a cemetery, we've come into contact with those who are no longer alive. It has a spiritually damaging effect on us. We don't, we don't necessarily see it, but we can perhaps get an inkling of feeling from it. One of the ways that we, we, we address that is to wash our hands, to spiritually elevate ourselves again, bring us back to the level of, of uh, spiritual beings. That's exactly the same ideas that are connected to the mikvah. Whether that's put it for kalim, whether that's for our utensils, immersing them in water, preparing them for our use as Jews, or for ourselves, whether that's men or women, going to the mikvah, immersing in that 40 seah of water. Now there's a great significance of the fact that it's a, a quantity of 40. 40, the number of references to 40 within Jewish tradition, particularly relevant is the idea of 40 weeks of pregnancy. And I was telling my wife before, I was discussing with my wife, I said to her, 40 weeks of labour. She quickly corrected me. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank God there isn't such a thing as 40 weeks of labour. But there's 40 weeks of pregnancy. The, also, we're told that the embryo is formed in the first 40 weeks. The child is formed in the first 40, 40 days, sorry. So the idea of 40 is very much, again, bound up with the idea of birth and rebirth. And therefore, when we go in, the, and the letter Mem itself, is the number 40. And therefore when we immerse in the mikvah of Mayim, the word Mayim is the word, is Mem, Yud, Mem, that's two of those letters, yud, uh, me, uh, letters Mem, the 40, with God's name in the middle of it. We are going, some, going through some sort of spiritual rebirth. We are going, so to speak, back into the womb, surrounded by liquid, yeah, the child is surrounded by this protective liquid in, in, in the womb and then when we emerge from that we emerge as new beings, we are spiritually purified uh, ready to face the world again, that's in, in a nutshell, or well, the concept you, think, it, it, you know, in essence it's, it, it seems, on the face of it the idea of putting things, utensils and ourselves into water doesn't seem to make much sense, but if you think of it through a spiritual lens, the idea is this concept of elevating ourselves, the idea of tahara, of purity. Remember we talked about food, the difference between food which is tame, impure, not unclean, but impure, and tahor, which is pure, which is fit for us to eat. Similarly, we go through that same process where we can, through the medium of water, we can spiritually elevate ourselves, we can spiritually be reborn whenever that is um, through this medium of water. And that's very much what mikvah is about. Well, there's a maximum of 40 lashes or something. Uh, that's another. That's, 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 I mean, I've never connected the 40 with anything because when you say it, 40 years. The flood of 40 days. Yes. Years. Yes. Yeah. Years of the yes. We were accused of having that because of the spies. But right, but so why was it? So why, you're absolutely right. So why was it 40? Because of the sin of the spies, they weren't ready to go into the land of Israel. They had to go through a purification okay. process which was a multiple of 40, this time 40 years. Yeah. Okay, so you're absolutely right. The, the number 40 is synonymous with spiritual purity. And that's why this whole concept of mikvah, unfortunately, because it's a private thing, it's a very discreet thing, unfortunately that's got skewed to become something of myth and mystery and misinformation. The truth is it, it touches on the most sublime aspects of Judaism. Judaism is not just about blind ritual, it is about uh, considering having, living on a level of consciousness where we understand the difference between spirituality and physicality and we live as both physical and spiritual beings but with the potential to elevate our physical bodies and everything we use in the physical world to a spiritual level. That I hope is the part thought we you, you try to remember about mikvah, that the concept of water is very much, you think about all religions actually, the great sanctity placed on, on water and the great use that water has within religions particularly within Judaism, um, you can see the, the, the amazing, amazing power that water, that mikvah has, both for our utensils and for us. Hey, I hope you enjoyed your outing. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you back in the classroom.
next Wednesday evening, 8.30. Don't forget to sign in. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank